Welcome to the query. This is Zan Khan. Free will, the power of acting without the constraint of necessity or fate. Free will has been a topic of debate within the philosophical and theological circles since thousands of years. Many great minds have argued in favor or against the notion. Today we have an author and a philosopher of physics to discuss this phenomenon in great detail. Welcome to our show, Ruth Kastner. This is Zan Khan. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Professor Ruth Kastner, many physicists say that according to physics, there is no free will. Uh, do you agree with the notion? No, I don't agree with that. Um, physicists often think that there's no free will because they think that Einstein's theory of relativity necessarily implies that the future already exists. But in fact, this isn't necessarily true. Um, what relativity says is that space and time are not independent, and they do get mixed together in a certain way. But along with this uh, goes the idea of, of uh, you usually represent, when you're talking in the theory of relativity, you represent your ideas on a space-time diagram, and they're used to representing both space and time on this diagram where you have uh, like a spatial axis going horizontally, and a time axis going vertically. And so you have kind of a map of, of space and time. And when you're working with this diagram, you can sort of put things anywhere you want on it. You don't have a clearly defined present on, on this map. Uh, it doesn't really provide a way for, for anyone to say where the present is. You just have all of space and all of time on one map. So typically what happens is that you put you think that it's all uh, all there and it, this is called a block world that the idea that that all of space and all of time already exist in this block world and that you can put events anywhere on this map so the idea being that you could put yourself somewhere on the map at the what you call your present moment and then you could also put an observer into the future into your future on this map and and since you can draw events anywhere you want to on this map it's tempting to think that the events are really there and that the future is really there and and of course there are more technical reasons also to for physicists to think that relativity implies this so-called block world where the future already exists in the same way as the present and the past but that's it doesn't really require that in fact uh, so is it possible that future is really not set in stone? Yes. Um, in fact, the space-time map that I just talked about is not the territory. And uh, the one of the problems come about, I think, because people think that this map is the territory and they think that, that the space-time map and the theory of relativity necessarily capture all of what's going on in reality. But it's important to remember that we can't indicate the present moment on this map. And that's, that's in fact, I argue that's because the map really doesn't capture crucial aspects of reality. And in fact, uh, the idea that relativity implies a, bl a block world logically is really not true. And uh, certain researchers such as Raphael Sorkin and others have, have in fact proposed in, in very great de technical detail a different picture of space-time in which it's actually a growing thing so that the, the present is well-defined in that theory and, and that the future does not exist yet so that it's not a block world. The future is not set in stone and it's all consistent with relativity and they've, they've shown that in, in publications. So, so it's the correct assessment really is that relativity does not in fact require this idea of a block world. The future really doesn't have to exist yet. That, that's a very compelling idea and a lot of people believe it and it's become a bit of a dogma, the idea that relativity implies a block world and that, that the future exists in the same way as the past. But in fact, it, it can be questioned and it has been questioned in the literature. So it's just not true that, uh, that relativity implies a block world. Does the quantum theory have anything to say about free will? Yes, it certainly does. Uh, quantum theory tells us in, in a very mathematically logical way that, that events are not all predetermined. There is, in, in general, there's some element of chance as to what's going to occur.
And in fact, this is what Einstein did not like about it. He, he called it God playing dice with the universe. And he really wanted to find some other explanation for the apparent indeterminism in quantum theory. Um, uh, so, but we also should keep in mind that there, there are many religious traditions that this is outside science, of course, and I acknowledge that, but it's, it's, it's a different way of knowing perhaps. And many religious traditions tell us that God gave us free will. Well, um, if that's true, then I've argued that, that quantum theory is in fact the perfect way for us to understand why we can have free will. But Professor Ruth Kastner, why is that so? Well, quantum theory tells us that, that the tiny constituents of matter, such as atoms and protons and electrons and so on, are not fully predictable. So that even if we prepare them in a certain way, so that we know what their state is, and we know everything that, that it's possible to know about them at the time that we prepare them, um, the theory tells us that despite that complete knowledge of, of their state when we prepare them, uh, we, we do not, we cannot predict with certainty what they're going to do in the future. Now, there are still some, some folks who have proposed different ways of interpreting quantum theory where they attempt to regain some sort of determinism, but they always have to add something to the theory. And so if you just look at the theory itself, it really doesn't tell you, give you any way to predict with certainty what's going to happen in the future with these subatomic particles. In some sense, it seems like nature has not decided what they're going to do in the future. They, they seem to be keeping their options open. So the idea is that um, if quantum theory describes all the substances in, in nature and at their fundamental levels, and if we ourselves are made of those substances, those atoms and those subatomic particles, then perhaps in some sense we can keep our options open too. If we, if our thought processes and our choices and our actions, our behaviors are all fundamentally described by quantum theory, then since quantum theory tells us that those, those kinds of systems keep their options open, perhaps we, we can keep our options t open too. And in some sense we do have those free choices. Uh, that tells us that we aren't fated, but how does that tell us that we can choose our actions? Well, what happens at the quantum level is that when the subatomic particles enter into certain interactions, they're, they're presented with some choices in a sense. What, how are they going to end up? And th this is what Einstein didn't like about the theory. It, the idea that it seemed to be a matter of chance as to what the particle would do. But this is intriguing because it raises the idea of, well, um, we don't, there's fundamental indeterminism. The, the objects have no causal mechanistic reason to choose or to end up in one kind of state with one property as opposed to another one. So is it possible, and I don't explicitly claim this in, in my own interpretation, but the idea is that there's room for the idea that it's, um, that if we ha if there's such a thing as volition, meaning the will to choose, the ability to choose and direct our choices, then then perhaps quantum objects might have some element of volition, and it's it's theoretically possible that they could participate in some way to to pick out their options, and if that's the case, then you know then not only would it it would give some ability at the quantum level to have volition and choice and to implement that choice but it would also explain why we only see one outcome when we observe things when we actually uh, observe our ordinary macroscopic world of experience we always see that the only one outcome really happens and could it be that there's some volition involved at the fundamental level wherein these quantum objects are are participating in some way to to steer outcomes to pick one as opposed to the others uh, Professor Ruth Kastner, aren't there laws that dictate those chances and would that mean that human choices aren't really free? Well, this is very intriguing because um, quantum theory does tell us that each outcome of a measurement has a certain probability. And there's a very precise rule that tells you what that probability is. 
Now, some researchers into free will have argued that, that this rules out the idea that we could really have free will because they claim that, well, then we would become a slave to this law of probabilities and we wouldn't really be free to choose because our choices would have to conform to this law. But there's a mistake in this argument. The, the mistake is, is trying to think of human choices as kind of like um, dictated by, by quantum observables and quantum states. And that what they do is they try to say, well, suppose, for instance, you're, you're presented with the dinner menu, uh, that this is like a, a quantum observation in some way, and your choice of what dinner choice to have from that menu is like a quantum choice. But this is really a misapplication of the quantum law. It, it, it's, it, there's a lot of assumptions that go into that kind of claim that we can model our choices, our you know, choices of a dinner menu item by a quantum state. And in fact, you can't really do that because you would have to be able to model the entire human being as a very tightly described quantum system, you'd have to know exactly how many molecules were were participating in that choice. You know what what their temperature was, what what's going on with uh, with your environment that might affect the the quantum system that you supposedly are. And it's a very complicated and unstable system that is changing moment by moment, instantaneously. And and the quantum law cannot accurately be taken to describe that kind of complex changing system. That it, at the microscopic level, the, the quantum states that would be involved would be changing incredibly fast. And so it's really not accurate to take this idea of a quantum, uh, a human being faced with some ordinary macroscopic choice of action as a quantum system that can be accurately modeled by this quantum probability law. But humans can still make free choices because of the quantum theory. Well, yes, I would argue that um, the, the fact that the world is still described by quantum theory means that it is not deterministic. Events are not predetermined. And again, that means we don't necessarily have this block world where, where our, the events are already in our future. The future is genuinely open. And it's possible that, that thought could be mediated in some way by quantum systems that, again, uh, could possibly have this volitional capability. If, if volition can come in at this subtle level such that human thought, and I don't claim to have a kind of account of, in detail of how human thought is modeled by the quantum level, but the, the idea, the possibility is there that in the future we, may, we might understand better how uh, the human thought is mediated at a subtle level by quantum objects, quantum systems, that again leave their options open. And so, so at any given instant, the quantum systems involved in, in being uh, presented with a certain choice of whether to go, say, you know, spin one way or spin the other way could trigger, could be involved in triggering a particular human choice. And, and they do have propensities that have to obey this, this quantum law. But within that law, at any instant, they, they may have this volitional capability to choose one over the other that, that provides for this collapse and this particular outcome to happen. So the idea is that, that it, our human thought mechanism can have this fundamental indeterminacy that is governed by, by propensities at any given instant, but could never be really observed to violate any law, and yet could be the, the opening for volition to enter at that subtle level in which those quantum objects can say, okay, I'm going to choose to react this way instead of that way. And that's where our free will can enter. Some philosophers say that all we can choose is how we see the world, but not what we will do or what will happen. Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with this. I think that I think that's too limited. And um, however, I agree we, we can choose how we want to see the world. But if that's true, that really allows for the idea that we could notice opportunities or options that we didn't notice before. So if we can change the way we see things and we can notice something we might otherwise not have noticed, then we, we're, logically it follows that we could notice an opportunity, an additional choice that we hadn't seen before when we didn't change the way we viewed things. Now, obviously, this presents a new option to us. And so then we... Uh, the idea that well you only had you had certain options that that you 
were restricted to choosing from and you weren't even choosing from those you were already fated well here we've chosen to see things a different way we have another option that's in play now and it seems illogical to say oh well that's just not a real option you know that uh, that's only in your mind and it's not really on the table because we routinely experience that we may choose to visualize or see things a different way and we end up choosing the option that we noticed when we saw to see it we thought to see it a different way so that option does seem like a real one that sometimes ends up being chosen and therefore where where did it come from you know so so the idea that well we can choose to see things differently but we can't act on any of those choices of course we can we routinely experience that thank you so much professor ruth kastner to be on our show thanks very much i'm glad to be here we have discussed the topic of free will with uh, Ruth Kastner. She gave her opinion on the notion and argued her stance. Until the next episode of The Query, this is Zan Khan. Take care and goodbye.